listening to the SBP Podcast, Mobile Filmmaking, Episode 105, and I'm your host, Susie Botello. I welcome you to meet Travis Mills. Travis is a filmmaker who shot an entire feature film, a Western, one of 12 Westerns that he shot in 12 months with an iPhone. But really quick, before we do that, let me just remind you, go to our website for the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego and get the details on how to submit your own films shot with smartphones and find out about the film festival that is going to happen next April 2022 in San Diego. The website is internationalmobilefilmfestival.com. All right, so here we are, our guest, our cowboy of the year, <laughs> cowboy with an iPhone, Travis Mills. Travis, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me on this. Appreciate it. Oh, you're so, so welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. I really appreciate it. Um, why don't you share a little bit with our listeners? I know I'm really excited to talk to you. You are the first person to have shot an entire feature film with an iPhone that, well, that's not a first, but the fact that you shot a Western is pretty awesome. Yeah. It was part of my 12 Westerns in 12 months project that I did last year in 2020, believe it or not, it would have been a hard project to do any year. And last year, <laughs> I picked the worst possible year for it. Um, but um, yeah, this is this is one of those 12 feature-length movies, and it's called The Woman Who Robbed the Stagecoach. It's the true story of a woman named Pearl Hart, who was one of the only women to ever rob a stagecoach. Um, so it's a very fascinating story I got, got in, intrigued by and became one of the films. Now, 12 films in 12 months, and one of them you shoot with an iPhone. Why don't you share a little bit about, first of all, what made you decide you were going to shoot 12 films in 12 months, and then why choose to film one of them with a phone? Okay, well, the real answer to your question is that I'm cr I'm crazy. Right? Everybody <laughs> everybody knows that I'm kind of a little crazy. And and in 2013, I did a project called 52 Films in 52 Weeks. I did a short film every week. That was kind of wow. the beginning of of this because when that was over with, I had not completely destroyed myself yet. So I said, what's the next big challenge? And I continued to make features over the year. But that year I said, well, the next big challenge would be 12 features, one every month. But they can't just be any features because you could shoot them all in your basement or a one room. You know, I thought the Western would be an interesting genre to explore in 12 films. And the project developed over the years. And, you know, as I was doing these films, one of my main goals was to just make them all very different from each other, to explore different aspects of the genre, to to make them in different ways. So example, one of them is, you know, a, a black and white artsy Western, and one of them is half documentary, half narrative. And then there's some more traditional ones. Well, the idea that of shooting on the iPhone, you know, most of us, I, or a lot, a lot of people, I think probably were mostly exposed to iPhone shooting when Sean Baker made Tangerine, right? That's probably yeah. become the, you know, that was one of the main um, films that really broke through and showed people it was possible. Well, it's been rolling around in my head since then. I had done some music videos on iPhone. I'd done some behind the scenes so I thought, you know, shooting a Western on a phone would be kind of a bold move. And I kept looking for the right project to choose for that tool. And uh, we bounced back and forth between a few ideas. At one point, we were even going to shoot one movie twice, once on 16 millimeter and then once on an iPhone to compare 
the two different versions, which I still think is a wonderful idea that I would love to do someday because I, I just think it would be fascinating to do the same script twice with those opposite, you know, um, tools. But eventually the Pearl Hart movie felt like the right one because I wanted a French new wave kind of on the ground in the moment feeling to this story. I wanted it to feel like we were just there with them, not in a polished period piece environment. So for me, that w this was the perfect story for that. Yeah, because it's kind of, um, I mean, are you showing in this in this story, I read a little bit about about her story. It's kind of a heartbreaking story, uh, quite honestly. I was reading a bit about, you know, how how this story all began. It's not like it's a big secret because this is historical. Yep. And and the fact that she um sort of disappeared. Yeah. Right? And that was one of the things that made me most interested in her story. So someone originally gave me a newspaper and said, check this out. This is interesting. And I read about this woman who robbed a stagecoach and I was kind of like, I don't see a, a feature film here. And but then I never forgot about her. And eventually I did more research. And the more research I did, I, th I thought before the stagecoach robbery and after is more interesting to me than just this robbery of the stagecoach. So and especially the fact that she kind of has her 15 minutes of fame and then she just disappears to the point where no one really knows what happened to her. There's theories, you know, and it was interesting working on the movie because especially with the lead actress, Lorraine, who does, first of all, does an amazing job. A second had never acted in a film ever before. Get out. I know. Are you Isn't that crazy? You've seen part of the movie now. Yeah, She's wow. incredible. When she auditioned, I was going to cast someone else from California who was way more experienced and had actually played Pearl Hart before. And then Lorraine came into our casting call locally. And there was something about her that I was just like, this is amazing. And some of my peers, some of my collaborators were like, you're making a mistake by casting her out. And I said, no, casting non actors can work if it's the right person. And um, obviously that was also true in Tangerine. Some of those people in Tangerine were just people, right. you know, from the street, right? From that lifestyle. And Do you think it's because you were using a phone as opposed to a traditional camera with all the connections and everything that come around that, that may have helped her, you know, feel more comfortable to act? Possibly. I think not throwing her in an, an environment with 15, 20 crew members looking at her all the time might have helped her just kind of be instead of thinking about the process as much. Um, that's a good question. I, I'll have to ask that, you know, and see if she has any insight. But she was just right for the role. But she, one thing that was interesting is as we were develop, as she read the script and as we were working on it, she and I actually kind of had a lot of headbutting moments together because she kept on saying, you know, Pearl never turns into like one of her heroes. She, she why doesn't she become this, you know, famous woman or inspirational woman? And my answer would be because she didn't, because. <laughs> That's more <laughs> like real life, you know, is, is that, you know, obviously there are great inspirational stories, but a lot of people don't do that. And that's what I really liked about this film is that it, it didn't have a conventional direct. It doesn't move in a conventional direction, right? It's not Wonder Woman. Nope. Nope. And, but to me, right. it's more relatable. And, and it was interesting. It was a very interesting process collaborating with her because more than any other actress in the past, and probably because she's not an actress, she's just a person, just an architect, she would argue with me a lot about the character. And sometimes she would, um, what do you call it? She, she would realize that the reason that she was fighting me were re was that what was happening to the character had happened to her or something related had happened to her and she didn't like that, you know, so she was kind of mm -hmm. fighting the truth, but it was a fascinating growing process for her. And for me as a director, it was like nothing I've ever done before. That's for sure. It wasn't always fun. It was fun sometimes. Um, but in the end, I think that the end product is obviously what matters most. Yeah. I mean, in the end, it's, it's a great story, you know, like you were saying from beginning to end, 
um, that's where the story goes. Now, I I have this question that I want to ask you. This I was just thinking about this. You were shooting this all around the same area, right? To some degree. It was all filmed in Arizona, but we traveled a decent amount. It was there's an area called Globe, Arizona, and a lot of it was shot there in kind of this these mountains and mining area, but we also went to Yuma, Arizona, and we did this in August. <laughs> And Yuma, wow. Yuma is one of the hottest places I've ever been. It was brutal. But we shot at the prison there where Pearl Hart was actually held, supposedly in her actual cell. There's not much left of the prison, but her cell is supposedly the one the one that they've, they've kind of you know designated as, as hers. Um, and that was amazing to be able to film there. That was, yeah, that's what I was alluding to with the question was the, you know, being able to shoot at some of the historical locations that, you know, that accompany the story in the, in the movie. I'm always a fan of that because, you know, Hollywood will shoot a movie that's set in Kansas, but film it in Mississippi. And that's makes sense to them, I guess. But to me, something is lost in that, a, a sense of authenticity. And, you know, when you film in Arizona, because it was, it actually happened in Arizona. And also you film with local people, you capture something that can't be faked. You know, there's just an authenticity to the environment. Um, it might be a little more rough around the edges, you know, like you saw the scenes with us, you know, riding through the landscape and all that. Maybe that's not as picturesque as if we went to Monument Valley or, you know, shot in some areas of New Mexico, but it probably more like the areas that they actually would have been escaping through. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah. And how true, because a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of movies, right. That are derived from biographies and things like that, that are written, uh, tend to twist things up for the show. Right. And I know there's not that much information, but you had to add some things, of course, yep. uh, to it. And also, because you were talking about shooting in the areas with the locals, were there any any locals that had some insights that, you know, could help with the story? Well, definitely. There was a, a woman that, that kind of manages the, the films and some of the history in that area named Molly Cornwell. And she was helpful in putting costumes together and just having inside. And there were other people that, that had specific stories, some local historians and people that work at museums. Um, you know, I didn't read any books about Pearl because I, I feel like it's dangerous when you're approaching a project to read a book, you might just take too much from that book. What I did was I read as many of the articles about her from then newspaper articles from then and now uh, and then I kind of cobbled together my idea of, of a timeline and the important things to show and then invented within the characters themselves. You know, like not a lot is known about Joe Boot, the character I play in the movie, who was her accomplice. Right. And there's kind of different rumors about him. Was he just like a dashing, handsome outlaw or was he a German, you know, one, one source said he was a German drifter. Were, were they friends or were they at odds? And so I just kind of had to make a decision there based on what I felt was most appropriate for this film. That's really, really interesting. Okay. Now I know since you've shot these other films traditionally versus this iPhone film, why don't you share with us? I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued in everything you're saying, but share with our listeners and myself, of course, some of these backstories about the differences that you found with this. And, and when you did, so you had your DOP, right? Mm -hmm. Your, I call them DPs. Yep. Me too. Uh, so you had your, yeah. So your DP was, was, um, working with a traditional camera and the same DP now is working on the phone. Just, Sure. I'm just, I would love to know how that conversation took place. The person that shot this film, the cinematographer, her name is uh, Sushila Candola. And I'd worked with her before, but actually not as a cinematographer. 
And I wanted to choose someone new for this, someone that, that I'd worked with her as an actress, but she, I knew that she also shot movies and I felt like she was experimental enough. And I also thought, you know, if I approach this with one of my regular DPs, it's going to be like battling a, a mindset, right? Whereas if I work with someone for the very first time, there's no mindset to battle. Everything's new together. And she did a great job of kind of approaching it that way. And one of the things that we were very on the same page about is when we first envisioned this, there was a question, should we get lenses? Should we, how, how much do we want to rig out the iPhone? And we both felt very strongly that we should not because part of making the film was also, you know, if you go out there with just your phone, not a whole lot of other add-ons, what kind of movie can you make? Just your phone and Filmic Pro. That's it, right? And that's right. what we wanted to do, especially with the that we shot on the 11 Pro Max and there's three lenses. When that happened, I was convinced we had to shoot with with a phone because I'm like, they're, they're giving us way more options now. Um, so I, I'm really glad that we did that. I mean, we just basically, it was the phone, a little cheap, you know, $30 gimbal <laughs> and a couple lights and that's it. So it was, it was quite an experience. Wow. You found a $30 gimbal too. <laughs> I think so. Maybe it was more, I don't know. I, I forget. <laughs> I forget, but it was, it was cheap, you know, um, yeah. It was I mean the whole movie was made for probably a production budget of about I don't know I would say 6 grand maybe maybe a little bit over 6 grand. So that's pretty cheap for a 15 day shoot, you know. Um Yeah. But I had to do films like that um during the 12 westerns because I just had to get it done, you know. Travis, you're an actor by by nature, right? But you're also a filmmaker, but you're an actor too, right? Well, I started off being more of a filmmaker and uh, directing mostly. And then it's only in the last few years, us really during the 12 that I'd done acting before, but during the 12, I said, you know, these people in front of the camera are having too much fun and I'm working too hard. <laughs> I need to be able to have some fun too. And I started playing some of the roles and I was like, wow, I really love this um, and love playing certain kind of characters. I'm not good as the hero. I'm not that kind of person. That's not my type. But as a goofball like Joe Boot is or as sometimes a, a really evil, psychotic bad guy, I can do these roles. But uh, so, yeah, it's something I enjoy. Oh, that's pretty cool. All right. So what brought you into this whole industry in the first place? Tell us a little bit about the little Travis who became uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I have an interesting background. I My parents were, are uh, evangelical missionaries, and we actually grew up overseas. I was born in Ecuador. I spent a good deal of my childhood in a ver not a very well-known place called the Comoro Islands off the east coast of Africa. So I grew up with this totally just kind of wild background, not a typical American kid, raised by American parents in a third world country. I was obsessed with movies from the beginning. Um, my parents say I watched Mary Poppins 20 times in a row when I was a child. So they knew they had an extremist on their hands and I stayed obsessed. I got more and more passionate about film as I went and I did go to film school. It wasn't Film school was not, for me, something that was that helpful because I'm a kind of a self-learner. I have to learn through trial and error. That's why I make so many movies is I'm constantly, you know, making mistakes and then trying to fix them. And um, in 2010, I started my company, Running Wild Films, in Phoenix, Arizona, with one of my retired professors. And I kind of just decided, hey, I'm going to I'm going to forget everything they taught me in film school. I'm going to listen to Jean-Luc Godard and Werner Herzog, and I'm going to pave my own way. And I've been making movies like a madman since then. Wow. Now, can you compare your experiences in the first films that you made to this first iPhone movie? Yeah, in some ways, because... I think we were working with so little 
when I first started out and just having to invent um, in all kinds of creative ways. And with this movie, we only, including myself, we only had a crew of four people for the iPhone movie. So in that sense, it was a lot like those older films. The budget was low, like those older films. And it was just kind of starting again because you have a new tool and you're inventing as you go, you know, and, and we also didn't have a ton of experience shooting on an iPhone. So we were kind of learning, you know, Oh shoot, you know, like we got to really watch the focus. We got to really watch the color balance. These are, these are things that we don't have to think about as much for with a regular camera. So we were learning day to day how to use the tool better and better. How did you, now you captured the audio for your iPhone movie, um, in the, traditional way right externally or yes we did we okay. we used like a simple h4n mixer with a boom mic so and i ed i'm editing currently on adobe premiere so it's not i know some of these mobile filmmakers are you know purists they will do everything through the iphone or or whatever phone and they'll even cut the movie and that's admirable for sure well, feature films are a different a different thing. I I only know of one filmmaker, uh, Jennifer Zhang, who did that, who edited her entire film on the iPhone. It's a seventy three minute film. Wow, you know? wow, that's a yeah, lot of work. Right, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. It is. But and she wasn't thinking about that when she was doing it. She was just getting it done. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, it's it's uh it's the first time somebody's done that. Kind of like, I don't know that many people that uh, have shot a feature film and have it be a Western and then shot it with an iPhone or shot 12 movies, 12 features, uh, Western feature films or any features that I know of in 12 months either. I don't think it's been done. I couldn't find any record of it being done and I can't find any record of someone shooting a feature length uh, Western on right. an iPhone. I know people have short short films i think and 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 that's really cool and i love short films but this was definitely an endeavor you know um and yeah. and uh i'm glad i did it there are times that uh it was incredibly challenging like i said especially with the year that we all had last year but it was worth it the films last they stand the test of time i think and they'll be around much longer than i will be in some form floating around on amazon or youtube so that's important well and that's the the other thing too that you selected a story that has a historical value to it so it's not like it can be just for pure entertainment um so it's sort of you know it just goes in the bin Here's another feature film type thing, you know, um, not just because it's a Western, you know, but you really chose a really good story to share um, about someone that, I mean, I didn't know about, about Pearl before, you know, I read about her because of you. Yeah, I think that, that basically a movie about her that really focuses on her is long overdue. There's been some Discovery Channel little episodes. There's... Back in the day, in the 1950s, there were a couple TV episodes that, that would focus on her, but nothing really serious. And I wouldn't be surprised in the next 10 years if all of a sudden we hear, you know, Kira Knightley is playing Pearl Hart in a movie or something, you know, because <laughs> I think it is a great story. And it's only a matter of time before someone with a bigger budget figures that out and probably gives it a different ending <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know the ending, guys, in case anyone wants to contact me. How does that story end? Don't ask me. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's historical, but uh, I'm sure you're, you're doing something to, to that, too. Um, can I ask you something? How did you deal with the dust? Because you're shooting out in, in the desert, basically. Yeah, I mean, the dust and the dirt was not as big of a deal. You mean in terms of keeping the phone clean and the equipment clean? Well, yeah. And also because, you know, so you're working with horses and people and every time someone's walking around, uh, they're lifting up dust. Right? Yeah. Right. And yeah, there's all these issues. And then that can also kind of hurt a little bit with, you know, it can affect the, um, 
the focus or whatever, you know? And so I just wanted to know how you were dealing with all that. I mean, we were all very dirty. You know, when you see us in the movie, um, that's not makeup. It's real. <laughs> um, you know, when I make these movies, I'm usually, and I'm acting in them, I'm usually quite a mess by the end of it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't remember the dirt and the dust being as big of a deal as the heat. The heat was a huge deal with the iPhone, more than the other cameras we've used, like the Black Magic. Um, if we were not careful, it would overheat. Um, we had to be very adamant about keeping an umbrella over the camera, shading it from the sun. You know, a, a couple of times we'd get careless and we'd do takes or rehearsals and we wouldn't have the umbrella. And then within five minutes, we had an overheated phone and we were kind of dead in the water for 20 minutes or so while it cooled down in the car. And and so we we kind of had different we had to develop methods. The heat was the real brutal thing, um, not just on the phone, but on the people too. Um, so I think the dust and the dirt just adds more authenticity to everything because we look like we're really out there in it, you know? Um, and people are always commenting about, I don't know, my car and my things. And I just say, look, I live in the dirt. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm one, <laughs> I'm one with the earth. Okay. So it's just part of, you know, I'm constantly on the move making these, making these movies. I, I actually practically lived in a Honda in a Honda Civic that was a stick shift and it had no AC. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so everywhere I drove in the summer, my phone would die. It would just die. And I remember taking bags of ice from the freezer whenever I was leaving <laughs> to put it in the little coaster thing where the drinks go. Yeah. Uh, and to set my phone on top of that and, and just watch everything melt in, within a half hour. You know, oh, it was just crazy. Wow. That is crazy. And then I'd get home and put it in the fridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the heat is um, no joke, that's for sure. Ugh. Yeah, it's it, it it's pretty crazy. So, how did you how did you um deal with the other the other movies or a, a lot of your actors? I It's not I mean, I want this to be about the iPhones and everything, but there's a huge similarity similarity between making movies mm -hmm. and making movies with iPhones. Yeah. Uh, and I think the whole the whole thing is is a, is a learning curve for listeners. They want to hear everything. So you're making 12 films. Are you changing the people that are involved in each one each time? Uh, are you shifting around? I I noticed, you know, some of the extras, right, that you had in your in your film were in, in different scenes and stuff because they were a community. But in all in the other films, I imagine, are you using the same people in the same crew or not? Yeah, well, a lot of times the crew behind the scenes crew would change just because, you know, they're working so hard. They couldn't necessarily do back to back films with me. That was that would be pretty tough. So they had to have a break. That's so that's I, your superhero strength, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I almost, you know, <laughs> pushed myself <laughs> to the limit. There was one person, my friend John Mars, who also acts in the movies. A he acts in a lot of them, but he was pretty much behind the scenes on nine of the movies. So other than me, he was there most mm -hmm. of the time. Now, what's cool, you know, if, if anyone's a Western fan, they know that back in the day, if you're watching John Ford movies or Howard Hawks movies or any of those films – you see a lot of um, familiar faces over and over again. And you might not know their names, but you're like, okay, this guy plays the outlaw in this one. And in this one, he's the judge. And in that one, he's the doctor. And that was what was kind of cool about those movies. And we don't have that as much anymore, character actors. What's kind of cool is that naturally happened during the 12 Westerns is that a sort of stock company formed and you started – if you watch the films on Amazon, you start to see familiar faces popping up and someone might be a really big role in one and then have a little cameo in the next one. And I think that's really cool and people, people who are kind of de devoted to watching them are really enjoying that aspect. And we would rely on some of the same extras – some people would travel, you know, several hours uh, to be extras in the film. A couple guys came down for for a few of the films to uh, 
to uh, um, from Minnesota. So uh, that was pretty wild, you know, but it was worth their time. So what about working with the horses? Did that slow you down a lot or? You know, horses are not easy to work with by any means. I, I think we, we got better with it. Every film understood them a little bit more. Every film um, had some good horse wranglers. Um, so that, that's, that's really the trick is the people that own the horses or that are wrangling the horses really know what they're doing. Um, so it didn't slow us down a ton. I mean, the, the main horse that you saw featured in the movie, her name is Lucy. And as you saw, both Pearl and I ride her all around. She was incredible. She never got, gave us any trouble. And P Pearl was a great rider, much better than me. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was, it was fun. You saw that scene where I almost fell off, fell off yeah. the horse, <laughs> which I think is pretty funny. Pearl saved you. Yes, she did. That was not <laughs> planned. Actually. Uh, the horse started to take off and I couldn't quite get on. And, and then there you go. She, uh, she grabbed me and pulled me on. So <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, they, She stayed in character basically. Cause she was carrying you, uh, in the story as well. Kind yeah. Of, right? Yeah, exactly. It was a perfect <laughs> character moment, um, which was, which was great. So, yeah, but yeah, overall working with the horses was, was great. You know, the stage coach was, was a challenge for sure. And, um, again, with, with the heat, having those horses out in the heat, we had to, you know, put wet towels on them and try to keep them, um, as cool as they could be. So, so, um, so, all right, let me ask you a couple of questions. Now you've edited, um, you're, you're in the editing process, right? Of this. I am. Yeah. And I'm kind of working towards a deadline because the film is already set to premiere August 28th in Tempe. So as I'm prepping this new film in Idaho, I'm working hard on finishing the edit for the woman who wrote the stagecoach and then I'll move on to the sound mix and, and all of that stuff. So it's uh, juggling a lot of, a lot of things at the same time. That is so crazy. I, I just, I can't get over the fact. So listeners, you know, I'm constantly pushing you, you know, make a movie, make a movie, make a movie. Um, and I'll, and, and most of the time I'm just saying, just make a short film. You know, the fact that you have a mobile phone, um, you know, speeds up the process a lot. And you're going to have that little conversation with someone about making a feature film here. And you're going to go, there's going to be that one time when you go, well, you know, there is this guy named Travis. <laughs> 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 and so there really are no excuses anymore. What would you say directly to our listeners uh, because like you said, I mean, it is a struggle to do, uh, but no one in filmmaking does it because it's, you know, it's all, you know, this flowery, rosy, you know, experience. Uh, but what would you say to them to inspire them to maybe they want to make their next we Western film? What are some things that you could uh, you could advise them on and then inspire them to go ahead and do it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's just, you can't take no for an answer and you have to constantly make some level of progress on your projects, you know, and that might be slow, but you, you can't just stay in your house and think about all the things that you should do or want to do. You need to make daily progress. I mean, the way I'm able to do what I do is that my Google calendar is full of tasks and every day I chip away at them. And at the end of every day, I've added more. And the next day, you know, it looks just as daunting, but then I approach it and I chip away again. Right. And it's just making baby steps towards getting everything done. And then all of a sudden, I've gotten a, a tremendous amount of things done, you know, and what might seem impossible, getting funding, finding horses, finding a location. It comes with time if you just work, 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 you know, and, and finding good collaborators is really, really tough. But you just have to it's a lot. It's so much trial and error, you know, and I've been doing this that way for 10 years and I've faced things this past week 
that are incredibly discouraging. And it's about falling down and picking yourself back up and moving on and continuing to create, you know, and it's never going to be easy, but it's worth it. I think in the long run, you sound like a real cowboy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm not a cowboy as much as some of the people that I work with, but I've definitely become more of one through this process. That's for sure. But I appreciate you saying that that's, that's very, very nice compliment. Very flattering. (laughs) <laughs> well, you said, you know, the, the whole thing about, you know, falling off and picking yourself back up. Yes, that's true. Very, very typical and dusting yourself off, right? Yes, basically. yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. That's fantastic. Well, one, uh, one last thing I want to ask you, just name three of your most favorite films uh, outside of Mary Poppins. <laughs> Uh, something you watched as an adult that, or maybe you're still watching Mary Poppins. I'm sure you no, are. Actually. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that really said to you, this is, this is something I want to go for. This is the kind of movie ultimately I'd, I'd like to make when I'm, when I feel like I'm not making any mistakes anymore, which you know, that day will never come, but still, what would you say? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I'll cheat a little bit. Um, Really anything by the filmmaker Werner Herzog, because not just his movies, like maybe Fitzcarraldo about the guy who (laughs) hauls a boat over a mountain in between two rivers in the Mm. Amazon, but also the way he does films. His writing is so... Um, he's been through so much more than any filmmaker that I can think of so much adversity in trying to get his movies made. So his interviews are almost like my Bible. I return to them and remember that this guy was, you know, thrown in prison in Africa when he was made, making a documentary there, you know? Um, mm-hmm. so him and his, his work would be one, um, an older filmmaker named Howard Hawks. Some of his movies like only angels have wings, Not just the films, but also the ethic behind the films. They're all about professionals. And the the question of all of his characters is, what's the best you can be? Are you good enough? Are you good enough to do the job? And when I started to see that in his films, whether they're about cowboys or pilots or people on safari, um, that ethic is was really interesting to me and i related to it a lot you don't see that a lot in our culture anymore but it's all about just professionalism and are you good enough um and then finally i would say the movie witness with uh directed by peter weir with harrison ford he's Mm -hmm. he's one that i'm reading his book right now and it's just that's kind of what a perfect movie looks like to me romantic um, violent, I hate to say it, but, but I want to make romantic, yeah. violent, beautiful movies. Um, so that, that really move people and, and, and that would be my, my end goal, I think. What, what's your favorite part of, um, of making movies? Is it the writing post-production production? At this point, it's still being on set and it has been, um, really being on set in the moment directing, is my favorite because there's so much problem solving. Sometimes it's infuriating, but feeling like people always laugh because when the thunderstorm shows up to ruin our movie set, that's when I turn on and they see me become a different person. And they're like, you're happy right now. And I said, yeah, because we have a problem and I need to figure it out. Right. Um, But there's also other problems on set like, you know, human beings that you can't really figure out. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's, that's something you can't solve, but yeah, those are tougher. Yeah. They're way harder than thunderstorms, tornadoes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think that being on set, watching it come, come to life, post-production is cool. It's not where my passion lies, you know, and, and I, th- I feel as I get older, I may start to transition into writing more. I'm starting to kind of feel myself leaning that way. Um, but right now I still enjoy being in the trenches. It is kind of like a war, you know, and I enjoy being out there as a soldier in the trenches. Well, I could imagine that someone who takes on the challenge and like you said at the beginning of this episode, 
um, definitely loves to be on the set because that's when all the craziness happened. That's, that's, you know, I, I shot, uh, uh, I didn't shoot it, but I was part of a production in Big Bear, uh, in, the, in April, at the beginning of April, end of March, blizzard, snow blizzards, oh, wow. we were shooting a civil war, uh, movie about, uh, Walt Whitman. Oh, wow. That um, sounds good. Yeah. What's it called? Is it done? Uh, I think it's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know whatever happened to that film. It's one of those. Oh shoot. Because <laughs> I love Walt Whitman. So that would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. I would love to considering it took three weeks <laughs> and everyone worked so hard on it. Um, yeah. I would love to know whatever happened to that movie. I don't think much happened, um, but it was, I, I was a production coordinator, so I spent most of my time putting out fires. Mm-hmm. Yep. And everything that was a challenge, <laughs> if you listen to some of my podcasts, I talk about them because I can't forget how much fun I had in this, um, in this production. It was wild and crazy. Um, you know, I remember when they were shooting the cannons, you know, and they were, they had the civil war reenactors that they brought in, yeah, right. Right. For, for these scenes and they were shooting these, you know, their guns and they had little like gunpowder in them, mm-hmm. but it doesn't go very far. It was just like, it's not, it's, it's just the powder. Right. Right. And I'm standing in front of it. This is so cool. This is so awesome. I've never been shot at directly where I'm just standing there going, go ahead and shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, you're so crazy. Yeah. And I was like, you only live once. Yeah. Right. Where can you reenact something like this ever? Well, I, you know? yeah, I can relate to that because we use blanks in our Westerns. We, we try not to ever use digital if we can help it. And um, yeah. I'm always... My my friend that I mentioned, main collaborator John Mars, is always telling me you're too close to the blank with the camera, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, I'm okay. Trust me, I'm okay. You know what I mean? Um, I, you, I, we can sacrifice me, but we can't sacrifice the shot. Um, so I totally get that. Absolutely. Yeah, you're crazy too. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, but yeah, and running in the rain, you know, some of the cables and the generators oh, and the yeah. lights when you're out there, there's thick as my leg and you're you're like bouncing around like a rabbit trying to get you know uh things it it's the most awesome thing and they're you know our listeners are just going these guys are crazy um they are but it is you kind of have to be crazy to do this and i encourage all of you to go nuts and do this stuff because it is a lot of fun and it's something that you know uh later on in life you know what I mean? You'll be able to tell your grandchildren that you were too close to the blanks. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. You'll be able to. I If I live long enough to be a grandfather, then I'll have lots of great stories to tell them. Probably that my children will say, stop telling them that you're a bad influence. Um, but yes, <laughs> it, it will. It will be fun for sure. <laughs> What a great pleasure it is to be a bad influence on grandchildren. Yes. Grandfathers, grandmothers, who cares, right? Yeah. Like, that's awesome. Absolutely. This has been fun. Well, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, and and now I have to ask you the very, very, I keep teasing you, the very last question. Mm-hmm. When's the next smartphone film that you're going to make? You know, for me... You know, everybody expects you to kind of repeat yourself. It's like when Sean Baker made Tangerine, they're like, why didn't you, aren't you going to shoot all movies on iPhone now? And it's an odd thing that we do because we're like, no, artists or creators are always wanting to switch things up, right? Um, But I think for me, I loved the experience and I will do it the next time that it feels right. And it's a gut thing. I think I'll just know I'll write a script or one will come my way and I'll say, this is another iPhone movie. And the next time my main goal would, I want to shoot it myself. I want to be the director and DP. I think that would be very immersive and fun. So that will, that will be the next challenge. Yeah. That's one thing that I'm noticing with actors too, is that they are making their own films. There was a, there was a feature in in 2019 uh, that won the best feature, and it's called Madhouse. 
uh, this guy from Australia, he's an actor, and he shot that film, uh, acted in the film, directed the film, wrote it, and edited. Wow. Film. Wow. Right? Yeah. Pretty, pretty impressive what people are doing. It's not so much because they're doing it on a phone. It's because the phone gives them, it's, it's such a challenge. When you're faced with a challenge, I'm sure you understand this uh, very well, but sometimes without the challenge, you don't know what you can do. You don't put your best out there. And what you produce is incredible because you had a challenge to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm not going to be able to get the quote right, but that favorite filmmaker of mine, Werner Herzog, said, you know, when you heat up metal or, or something like that, basically when you put something under incredible, um, you know, heat, then it, it changes its form, right? And that he, his argument that was that the artist um, or humans can kind of be like that when, when pushed to the limits they'll, they'll show you something new, something different. So, um, I think that's kind of an interesting idea, you know, is, is really challenging yourself and you, you show yourself something that, that you never thought was even possible. Yeah. You got to make it happen now. You've already started it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Awesome. Well, I know you're busy. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, say goodbye to our listeners. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, Susie, I really appreciate it. This has been a great pleasure talking to you. And hopefully it's not the last time we chat. Mm-hmm.